Today, we are looking at Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene is a woman we're told that Jesus found and cast out seven demons from her. From a horrible life of slavery to those demons, she has been delivered by Jesus, and she has carried on an intimate, close relationship with him as her Lord, as her teacher, as her master. So that's where we are coming to the text. Mary is at the tomb now. The disciples, we meditated on that passage earlier in the morning. We had a, we had a 7 o'clock worship service, and there we talked about Peter and John and all those things that were happening there and all the unbelief that was there. But Mary stayed behind at the tomb. And that's where we pick up the story. It's John chapter 20, verse 11. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him, Rabboni, in Aramaic, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I am praying, Lord God, for my brothers and sisters here, as well as for myself, that you would speak your word to us, that you would cause us to hear your voice say to us that you still care for us, that you still love us, that you still know our name. Help us to hear that voice. Right now, Lord God, a lot of things are competing for my own attention And I'm asking you, Lord, to allow me to get out of your way. Lord God, you know my heart. You know what a people pleaser I can be and how much that can bear on my conscience and distract me even as I preached. But Lord, this message is so precious, Lord God. It has been on my heart all night last night. Kept me up, Lord God, thinking about it. Lord, it is too precious of a message to let someone like me get in the way of it. So speak. Come. And speak your word to our hearts. Come in such a way that we deal with the risen Lord before we live, leave today. Help us to bless you now by the way that we listen to your word. One of the best ways we can worship you is to listen to your word very carefully to every word that falls from your lips. Me, along with my fellow sheep, are listening for the, for the shepherd's voice, we pray that you would speak. We love you very much. We pray, Lord, that the way we listen to you and the way that we respond might express it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Welcome. It's great to see you. Awesome. Okay, very good, very good. Oh, wow. All right. Excellent. Um, There is a scene in the Old Testament. There is the most holy place, the place that is set aside, and often I've shown you pictures of it. And the holiest place in Israel was the tabernacle or the temple. The holiest place in the temple was not the outside covering, but the inside. The holiest room in the temple was the holy of holies. There's a holy room, and there's a holy of holies, which is on the inside, and the way on the inside. And on the inside, there was some furniture inside the holy of holies. 
And the most holy of the holy furniture was the Ark of the Covenant. If you've ever seen the movie, The Raiders of the Lost Ark, that's what the Ark was. It's not Noah's Ark. The Ark was something like, uh, like, something like this, a box. And it was a box with gold layering, and it, was, it, had a, it had a cover. They called it the mercy seat. What do they call it, everyone? The mercy seat. And this mercy seat had two angels with wings spread forward like that. And where the wings covered and where the lid was, that was the mercy seat. And in the middle of that was the very presence of God, what they call the Shekinah glory. Say that with me, the Shekinah glory. This is the Shekinah glory, the very presence of God, so holy that the high priest, every year when he went in to do, to do service there, he had to go in wearing bells just in case he died. If he died, then the bells would stop ringing and then they would have to pull him out. Why would he die? If he went in in an unworthy way, the place was so holy, the presence was so holy that the presence could kill the holiest man in Israel, the high priest, if he went in in an unworthy way. And if he were to die there, it is said, the tradition says, that he would have a rope tied to his waist so that everybody could pull him out without them having to go into the holiest place awesome place, the Shekinah glory, glory, the awesome presence of God. Are you guys in awe yet? I have a few of you. Let me see if I can, we're such a visually oriented age, right? Let me show you a picture of what I, what I think is, it might be what it looked like. If I could put that up there. There it is, okay, just in case you needed it. It's an artist rendering of the Ark of the Covenant. As you see, there's a box there, and inside the box, they had the Ten Commandments, the tablets of God, the covenant contract between God and his people. You have the two angels that are there, and in the middle of that is the very presence, and sometimes the visible presence of God, The Shekinah glory. And you don't mess with that. Isn't that cool? Are you all in awe? Some of you are. And others of you, I'm judging from the expressions, you're like, not so much. (laughs) Not so much. It's just a drawing. Yeah, I know. I kind of feel where you're coming from. I will leave it at that for now, okay? So you have that visual picture in your mind, right? The two angels there, the mercy seat. I love that name, the mercy seat. The fact that anyone could even come in the presence of that holy God is mercy from the beginning to the very end. Amen? Amen. Anyone could come to that. All right. Hold on Hold on to that thought. It has something to do with our message today. Okay? All right. Mary. We're coming back to Mary now. Mary is weeping outside the tomb. She had already gone to the gravesite of Jesus. She went there with a bunch of women wondering who's going to roll away the huge stone that is in front of the grave. I mean, it's a, it's a many, many ton stone, and it's an uphill climb to push it out. Who's going to do it for us? They don't care. They're going to the grave to finish anointing the body of Jesus for burial. And it seems like Mary among the women were the, was the most eager it seems like she got to the grave first. And so she was the first one to see that the grave was blown open. The door was blown open so that the women could look in. By the way, think about that for a minute. Let me just, this is just a freebie. Was the, you know, whenever you see the passion plays and things, all of a sudden there's a thunder, blah, 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 and then all of a sudden the rock just kind of bo- splits open or bounces away, you know? And then Jesus emerges triumphant, Right? Well, if you think about it, did Jesus have to have the door open for him to get out? No, because he could walk through doors after, walk through closed doors after his resurrection. It wasn't so that Jesus could get out that the, that the rock was rolled away. It was so that the women and everybody else and you and me, we could look in and see that Jesus is no longer dead. That the, that the grave of our Savior is absolutely empty. And Mary sees this, goes back to the disciples, and then it brings the disciples. The disciples come, they see it, they're bewildered, and they finally believe her that the body is taken away, but they don't really get it. They don't really believe that Jesus is risen from the dead. It says it right here very clearly. Um, 
uh, right there in verse, 11, verse 9, it says it like this. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. And the disciples went back to their homes. But, I love this but here, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. She stayed behind. She stayed. The first part of, of, of the message is, go, is, go, is about single-minded devotion. Here is Mary who had been delivered from seven demons that had been tormenting her soul. They had taken her captive. She was their slave for the longest time. Jesus comes and delivers her from these slaves, and she becomes a disciple of Jesus, and she's been following after Jesus. And now, even though her master is dead, there is a certain residual faith that clings to whatever it can possibly cling to, even if that's just the dead body of her Lord. She'll still do that because that faith However, the understanding is not good. It's still clinging on to something and trying really hard, at least, to do that. She doesn't go home. She stays behind. So there are three ways in which I see Mary's devotion. From the text, you see Mary's devotion, uh, the the single-minded devotion that Mary shows here. First, it shows up from the fact that she sticks around and looks for Jesus in the grave. She is looking. She is seeking her Lord. The second way it shows up is that she looks beyond the angels. Now, when the disciples looked into the tomb, all they saw was an empty tomb with linen, with clothing, check this out, with clothing that was on the bench, and then there was a headpiece clothing, and they were all collapsed. Are you with me? So it's not as if somebody could really steal the body because the clothing was exactly the way they had left it. It was as if the body had come right through the clothing. That's what the clothing was testifying to. But the disciples could not see that. And they didn't really see anything because they left the place. They didn't confer further. They didn't do anything. They just left. But Mary stuck behind, and when she looked this time, What she saw were the angels sitting where Jesus was lying down before. It was like a bench where the body would be laid, and at the head and at the foot were two angels. Are you with me? Now draw that picture in your mind. Draw that picture in your mind. One angel here, one angel here, and the dead body of Jesus here, or the empty body of Jesus here. Doesn't it look a lot like that picture that I showed you just a little while ago? That's exactly what it is. It is the very Shekinah glory surrounded by the angels. And it's the emptiness of that space that declares the presence of the risen Lord. Shekinah glory. The angels. Isn't that cool? Are you in awe yet? (laughs) We should be. And so should Mary but Mary like, was like some of you guys a little bit earlier. Eh. And she walks away. She walks away. She sees angels here. Angels. Physic- literally visible angels here. She grew up, in, grew up in Sabbath school. She's got to know what this is a picture of. But she don't care because she don't see Jesus. And so she's out of there. She doesn't care. The, the, the angels are bewildered. They say, well, woman, why are you weeping? You see, they understand that Jesus is risen from the dead. They understand. They see what's going on. But they, don't, they can't possibly get why this woman would be I mean, think about it. From the angel's perspective, if she came and found the dead body of Jesus, then she should cry. But she doesn't find the body of Jesus. The angels are thinking, Jesus is risen from the dead. Why is this girl crying? They don't get it. And she, knowing that they don't get it, doesn't, it doesn't matter to her. She doesn't see her Lord. She turns around and walks away from the angels. Because she's only seeking Jesus. She's not seeking the angels. She's not seeking anything else. She is seeking Jesus. Single-minded 
devotion. That's how the text says this. When the, when the angels asked her, why, why are you weeping? She gives the reason. They have taken away my Lord. I don't know where they have laid him. And having said this, right, it seems like she doesn't even wait for a response from the angels. <laughs> having said this, she turned around. She's gone. <laughs> I, don't, I don't need to be here anymore if Jesus is not there. Having, but look at what happens next in verse 14. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Maybe she notices a certain tenderness in the voice of this gardener. And so she says, if you've taken away the body of Jesus, I'll I'll take that body away right now. I'll do it. Think about this for a second. I don't know. Maybe she was thinking she'll go and get some help. But she's all by herself. And all she wants is the body of Jesus. How in the world is she going to... Have you ever tried to carry dead weight? It's not easy. She doesn't care. She just wants to see her Jesus, see her Lord. She is so singularly devoted, noting a note of tenderness in the seeming gardener's voice. She says, please, if you know where he is, if you know where my Lord is, could you, could you just please tell me where he is? And you won't have to bother with it. I'll take care of everything. This is Mary, her singular devotion to her Lord. Nothing else matters. But what's fascinating is that she is not the only one with devotion here. She's not the only one with devotion. That devotion is given back. It's reciprocated. Not only... Mary is seeking Jesus only to find that Jesus has been seeking her. Look at what happens. Jesus said to her in verse 16, Mary, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni. Here is the moment of recognition. So far, she thought that this was the gardener, and then the gardener, maybe she just wasn't looking up into the gardener's eyes out of respect. I'm not sure, but when Jesus called her, hey, Mary, (laughs) she looked up. She turned and saw him, and that changed everything, everything. It says here in the text that she said, Rabboni, Rabboni. Uh, What is the significance of the word Rabboni? You know how I like to bring out to you words that are in Aramaic, because this is a Greek text, but there are Aramaic words like the word Abba, is a word that Jesus used because Jesus spoke Aramaic, right? It's like I'm speaking in English, and all of a sudden I do something like this, where I go, you know, all of a sudden, right, I flip to the Korean or something like that. Why? What is going on here? This author is quoting Mary's language of intimacy with her Lord. This word Rabboni not only means teacher, it also means my teacher. My teacher. So, in this moment of recognition, she has found the one she has been looking for. Jesus says, Mary, which is the same word that Jesus used all throughout the three years of ministry to, uh, to address her. And when she hears Jesus' voice, nothing else matters. And she says, Rabboni. And there's that moment of recognition. The intimacy is restored. Not only restored, but also deepened. It's even deeper than it was before. Um, where do I get that? Let's go a little bit further. This is going to be a little bit tricky. You get this in Jesus' further statement, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. There you go, wait a minute. That doesn't sound very intimate to me. (laughs) She says, here's Mary, She falls on her face and grabs onto her feet, his feet probably, right? Just grabbing onto whatever she can possibly grab onto. And she grabs onto her feet. She was expecting a dead corpse. Here she, here Jesus is, alive in the flesh. How, how, how much more joy could there be? And she grabs onto him. And instead of grabbing her back, 
which we would expect in our American context, a big old hug and a reunion. Jesus says, don't cling on to me. And I'm trying to tell you that is an invitation into deeper relationship. It seems like he's pushing her away, but it's not. It's not. In the light of what Jesus has already said, it's an invitation to a deeper relationship. Let me show you some of the conversation Jesus had before he was crucified and raised. Let me show you two verses. It should make it clear. Do not cling to me. I have it there, right? John chapter 16, verse 7. This is like the night before Jesus is being uh, arrested. Night, on the night that Jesus is arrested, he says these things to his disciples. He says, it is to your advantage that I go away. If I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Who's the helper? The Holy Spirit. If, the only way that the Holy Spirit is going to come is if I ascend to my heavenly Father. If I go to him, it is to your advantage. It's better than how you have it now if I go. Because I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. And what will happen when the Holy Spirit comes? The Holy Spirit will live inside of your hearts. Jesus said that the Holy Spirit was with you. Now he will be in you. And what will that result in? Verse four, chapter 14, verse 18. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Do you see that? By Jesus saying, hey Mary, don't cling on to me. I have not ascended to my heavenly father. What is Jesus saying? Don't be satisfied with finding a dead corpse. And don't even be satisfied with going back to our relationship of me walking with you in a physical way. No, wait until you have me in your heart. Wait until I am closer than your very breath. Wait until I am part of the very fabric of your, of your being, the very f- center of your world. Jesus says, this is what's going to happen. You look forward to this. Don't settle for grabbing on me. Jesus was not going to disappear if somebody touched his resurrected body. Do you know what he does? I'm I'm blowing away my further sermons a little bit later. But, you know, do you know what he does when Thomas appears? And he said, said, I'm not going to believe until I touch his hand, the scar, and put. Jesus says, do it. Do it. He's not going to. He's not hurt. He's not going to disappear if somebody touches his, his resurrected body. No, Jesus is saying to Mary. Don't be satisfied with so little. I have so much more to offer you. We have so much more intimacy to experience. All right. I have just a couple of areas of application for you and for me today. First, I would challenge you not to settle for a dead corpse. Don't settle for an idea of religion. Did you know 80 to 90% of America says that they're Christian? Did you know that? And we have a whole, whole, we have a whole bunch of three-time Christians. That's, that's Christmas, Thanksgiving, and Easter, right? <laughs> and we're kind of banking on that. And I mean, like, you know, Shepherd of the Hills has a wonderful ministry, right? Easter at, at, at the Shepherd of the Hills. And, and they, I, I love what they're doing. I love that idea. They're kind of going off that model of 80% of the people consider themselves Christians. Sure, then they should be in church on Easter. They invite everybody and proclaim the gospel. I think that's a wonderful thing. But a vast majority of the 80%, are they not? Are they not settling for just, this, the, just the idea of Christianity, the morality, the good life that comes with Christianity. If they are just in love with just the trappings of Christianity, they are missing out. You know what that's like? I love this illustration. You know, have you? I'm sorry. I, I just, uh, what's your son's name again? Nathan. Nathan, have you, do you like oranges? Yeah, yeah you like oranges, right? Well, if I gave you an orange, it's like the juiciest orange in the world, right? And I peeled it in front of you, right? I peeled it in front of you, and then I took out the middle, and it was nice and juicy. It was just dripping, dripping with through my fingers, and, and your mouth is like, you know, I can't, salivating, you know, whatever. Anyway, so, <laughs> and, and then I say, Nathan, you want some? You would say, you would say, 
I'm hoping for a yes. Okay, yes, all right. <laughs> okay, not if it's been in my hand like that, I suppose. But, but anyway, so if, if I just, if I say you want some and you happen to say yes, and I just throw you the orange peels instead of the orange, how would you feel? Yeah, what a jerk, right? What a jerk, right? But yeah, okay. This is where I'm going with that illustration. If we are going to be satisfied with the trappings of religion, with the religiosity, stability, and the morality that comes with it, and miss out on the living Lord, it's like settling for those orange peels instead of the juicy middle. Jesus is the juice. Do you see what I'm saying? Jesus is at the very core. Do not settle for the dead corpse of empty religion, religiosity, not religiosity, relationship relationship. Also, don't settle for the, not only the dead corpse, but your past experience of the living Lord. Some of you may want to go back to that place where you felt so intimate with God, where you were so close to God that it can even divide you two because you're so close to Jesus. And you're always thinking, man, if I could go back to that place, has it occurred to you? Maybe through your trials and through you going through that dry period in your life, he may be wanting to take you deeper. To take you deeper. Don't settle for your past. You have a glorious future that the Lord lays before you with Jesus at the very center. Don't settle for the dead corpse. Don't settle for your past relationship with the living Lord. Settle for the living Lord in your heart. Every day being renewed and growing in him. Also, I would challenge you to listen for him calling you. Listen to his voice. Listen to the circumstances beyond your control that God brings together. And notice his loving hand in them. If any part of this message has spoken to you, I don't know you well enough to cater it to you. But if God has spoken to you, receive it as God's word being spoken, his presence being made clear, his telling you, I'm right here with you right now. I know you haven't been feeling it of late, but I'm here with you right now and I'm calling your name. I'm calling you out. Christine, I'm here with you right now. Heidi, I'm right here. Steve. Right now, hearing his voice, calling your name. Jesus says, I know the names of my sheep. And if you and I are not being able to hear that, there's something off in our relationship, isn't it? Listen for the voice of God. He is speaking in everything and in every place. He is speaking in this message. He is speaking in this place. He is speaking through your circumstances Hear him call you by name. And I pray that this coming week, that it will be a more personal walk with Jesus than you've ever had before. Spend some time in his word. Spend some time in prayer. Even though you may not feel it at the moment, as your actions are given to God, your feelings are meant to follow. Where your treasure is, do you see that? There your heart will be. It's not where your heart is, there your treasure will be. We're so feelings-oriented right now, aren't we? How do you feel? (laughs) What's the question? How do you really think about that? What does your core say? No, no. Your feelings can deceive you all the time. What you know to be true, set your heart on that. Place your treasure there, and your emotions eventually will follow. Repent of wrong emotions. Trust in Jesus to bring them in his time. You do what's right. And love him with all your heart. Don't settle for going back. Look to the future. Hear him call your name. And when he does, you respond. I say, I'm right here. Rabboni. Master, teacher, Lord, lover. <laughs>